Hello, coaches. Welcome back to another episode of Coach Better Spotlight. Today, we're chatting with Jordan Benedict, teacher and data coach at Shanghai American School in China. This spotlight episode highlights the ways that Jordan uses data to track the impact he has as a coach and some great strategies all coaches can use, whether they're just getting started or have been coaching for years. If you enjoy any part of this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more conversations like this, please subscribe to our channel and click the notifications bell to find out every time we release a new episode. Remember, you can also listen to the full Coach Better episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are passionate about the impact coaching can have on student learning, school culture, and teacher professional growth, and we want to help you coach better. We've got some great opportunities for more learning after today's conversation, so stick around all the way to the end. Welcome back to another episode of Coach Better from Maduro Learning. I am here with Clint and Jordan. And Jordan, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your education experience and your role at your school? Hi, my name is Jordan. Um, I'm a teacher and data coach at Shanghai American School. Been international um, for about eight years now at the American School of Dubai and now um, Shanghai American School. Uh, my role at school, I'm a full-time teacher, but uh, when I first joined the school, I had a partial load, and they learned a little bit about my talent with data. Um, and so I've been branched out, and I work with our coaching teams on developing data protocols or adding data to people's personal practice questions, um, or allowing doing some map dives, allowing my admin teams to look at whole school data. And more, more recently, I get roped into accreditation reporting as well. Uh, but I find that actually fun from a data perspective. So I get this whole other world of analyzing and um, uh, growing people's data literacy. What kind of data do you collect and analyze about your coaching practice? And how do you know that your role is having an impact as a data coach? <laughs> that is a great question. And I'm... Um, I'm still flushing out methods. I listened to your group chat where you had some coaches ask about, or you asked that same question to a group of coaches. Yep. And um, I have a lot of ideas, but I haven't enacted them yet, right? And so part of it, if, if I had my dream scenario of what a coach could do to measure their impact, I think you would do something similar to what we do as teachers, right? So for me as a teacher, um, my admin looks at, um, they walk through, they see my lessons, my students give surveys, and my parents give surveys to me, right? Um, and then there is some results, academic results as well. I think if you're a coach, why not have your um, coaches take surveys? Why not have your admin provide feedback? Um, and why not see the re share the results of your coaching activities as part of your portfolio. And there's your data that shows your impact as a coach. I know one of your coaches was talking about measuring where they were and who they're with. And I think that's really valuable. That's a great exercise to see where is my impact felt. And that could be a part of kind of your uh, coaching portfolio. I have a coach friend who really logs what their coaching interactions are, who, what kind of conversation it was, who it was with, and that's their data as well. But I, I still believe in that multimodal approach whenever you're measuring something. And that's where I think um, surveys, feedback, um, and a portfolio would make a lot of sense for a coach. Love it. It's, we are trialing this year, we're looking into a, a teacher professional growth model by a group called Tripod Learning, I think. And it's the seven C's of, of teaching. And it's about conferring and caring and collaborate all of these words that start with C I can't remember off the top of my head but that's exactly the model that we are going with with teacher professional growth that we're piloting is 
you know, they have a, an instrument that they give to students at an age appropriate level to collect, that you as a teacher can collect data about your teaching practice, you know, by surveying 50 students, right? And so then you can use that data to inform your inquiry questions. You can use that data to help you come up with some ideas. Where do you want to focus? Um, you've got, we want them to keep a portfolio of work um, so that they can say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about how I'm conferencing with kids and what this looks like. And so these are the strategies that I've tried and here, et cetera. And so what we have done as a group is some, well, how do we take that idea with our coaches? Because the, that questionnaire and those, those domains don't really fit into coaching, the, the coaching model. But how do we do something similar with coaching? And it's exactly what you said is, you know, where are your walkthroughs? Where are your observations? Where are your surveys with the people that you're working with, with the teachers? How are you keeping that information? How are you keeping a portfolio of that information to show growth? Um, nothing out there exists that, that I've been able to find. You know, so we're like taking something and we're trying to put our spin on it, but it's not, I don't feel like it's quite, Right. The idea is right, but the, the content or, or those questions aren't right. And it's, it's how do we come together as a coaching collaborative to be like, this is how we're going to define coaching because it's so different in every school too. Like what, what hats are you wearing? What coaching hats are you wearing? What, what's your emphasis? You know, what does your admin want you to be doing? or Your supervisor wants you to be doing? What does that look like? It's so variable school to school. And even I the, think implementation of what coaching is is different from school right. to school right so to be able to come up with something that is like a package you can just take and implement it it almost feels like that would be really challenging because coaching does look different in different places but conceptually coaching can be very similar like how do you get it down to the concept rather than to the, the content yeah i just think uh, even listening to Jordan's thing, thinking about a portfolio, is it the coach's responsibility to keep that portfolio or is it the teacher's responsibility? Because once it becomes a teacher's responsibility, it's another potential barrier in the way of being coached because now I have another task I have to do. I have to keep a portfolio. I already have to document my professional learning growth in a variety of ways for a variety of different people. Now I got to do something for the coach too. You know, like thinking about those kinds of pieces and if the coaching culture is so rich and dynamic in the school, like we've heard from some of the people that we have talked to, then, then maybe for those schools, that would be no problem. But for another school where it's new and they don't really understand it, maybe that's not the time to be analyzing the results and that's not the time you implement something like a portfolio, but just kind of trying to look at it from both ends. How do you make it as easy and achievable as possible while still being authentic and like, have some depth really is what I'm thinking about. You can get a lot of depth in longitudinal data. And so, you know, think of how many coaches you might have in a given year. And even if you just started with surveying what they thought the impact uh, of that coaching experience was, um, that longitudinal data provides a lot of of analysis you can do to show, show your impact over time, which is um, extremely powerful. And so if I was going to tell somebody to start somewhere, it'd be from creating a under 10 question survey for your coaches that they do kind of at the end of a cycle. Um, that's, you know, easy. You can even then bring them together at the end of the year and do, again, I like those focus group interviews as well as separate one-on-one -on -one interviews, but um, you could do a focus group with a couple of them that might pair well together. Um, but I think that's an easy place to start that whether a school's ready for, um, portfolios, if they don't do like our school does like a shared doc where I have to put, um, artifacts of my professional growth over time. If your school doesn't quite do that yet, uh, surveys are something that's easy to employ. And I actually don't mind if the questions aren't perfect, right? Mm -hmm. The goal for me often with data is to start measuring and start taking action and then tweak as you learn better and think that the questions would work better so that you can then fine tune your actions even further. I have a nerd question first, a, a geeky statistical nerd question first, and then I've got a, a coaching question. My first geeky statistical nerd question is how many data points would you, if you've got a, a 10 question survey, how many data points do I want in order to feel like I can see a trend or that I can, I have a pattern to be able to be like, 
now I can act on this. Because one person might not like me and give me terrible uh, uh, results. Another person might be my best friend and be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to give Clint great results. Now I'm all over the shop. Like, how many do I need to feel comfortable saying, okay, I feel like I can say on this criteria, I am, to use standards-based grading language, meeting the standard, that coaching standard. So my question to you, Clint, would be, if you received that first one back and it wasn't great, would you act on that data? Um, no, because I have my implicit bias, like I said, right? Show me the data. I disagree with the data. <laughs> I need more until, you know, I mean, that's kind of human nature, right? I'm going to get as many right. results until I get the result that I want. <laughs> and so I guess my response to that is, you know, even on the first data point, I'm probably going to shift if I'm looking at it, right? right? I'm not going to wait till six or seven or 20, right? On the first one, I'm going to be looking at it. I'm going to be shifting my thinking. I'm going to be kind of taking an inquiry stance into the data that I just received. Um, and then the second one, I'll see if my inquiry stance has changed the position of, of my new coachee, right? I'm, I'm not waiting, again, for 20 more data points. I, I'm, I'm starting to take action right away. And I think what you're also wondering is when does it become statistically significant? And that's, a, that's an art as well, right? That is because um, some statisticians are comfortable with small sample sizes and some require larger, right? The, and so... I think from an education perspective, my answer is even after the first one, you would break it down, think about what does this data say, what could it mean, and what could I do? Um, I wouldn't wait till five or six. If you've enjoyed any part of this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more great conversations about coaching with inspiring educators from around the world, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notifications bell to find out every time we release a new episode. To hear the full-length conversation, subscribe to the Coach Better Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're looking for even more resources to help you coach better, head over to adurolearning.com slash coach better to explore over 20 online courses designed by coaches for coaches. Catch us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Adura Learning to connect with us. See you next week on Coach Better Spotlight.